Marvellous. So, huge welcome from uh, me and from Opus to our evening's discussions. Um, are you well? I am. I'm very well. In fact, I'm by the seaside. So out there is the English Channel. Right. So well, I can't show you, obviously, but I'm actually <laughs> on the seafront. You said that's out there. It's <laughs> in Sidmouth, in Devon. That is good to hear. It's good to hear. I should say uh, to everybody that uh, we first met back when we were both at Purcell School, when you were a extremely fine oboist, mostly. Is that, that, is that fair to say? Oboe was your principal study? Um, oboe was my principal. I played violin as well, but I gave it up when I was about 16. And I played piano too. Piano, yeah. yeah. And I started singing. Yes. When you yeah, started singing so, that yourself. But oboe was my principal. Sorry? You started that's okay. I, I, I interrupt you. You started singing at Purcell. Yeah, I mean, it was, as you'll remember, it was a huge part of our training there to, to do. Well, we used to do oral training every morning with the Kodai method. And so we started singing magical wars and a lot of modal music. And then we had the school choirs and chamber choirs and so on. So, yeah, that's where I started out. So, I mean, the, uh, after Purcell, you spent a sort of year being an oboist, is that that's correct, pretty much? Or did you, did I, well, you took I a year off from university? No, I, I actually had two go years, um, partly by mistake. Uh, and I ended up playing oboe for a theatre company and travelling around the UK and we went to the States as well. So I was uh, yeah, on stage oboist for a, a large part of those two years. Yeah, so, so I think what's really interesting to me is you then went to Oxford, you were a cool scholar, um, you, you were reading music, obviously, uh, and that was, that's a very tr traditional route. So where did, you, where did you first get interested in folk music? I mean, where did that, that come from? Because I, I mean, I, I, I guess I didn't, you are a couple of years, at least a couple of years younger than me, and uh, uh, so I didn't know well, that. That wasn't really part of the school. I'm actually quite a lot younger than you. <laughs> you were a head boy in, in your final year when I came. I was five years younger than you. Oh, well, I still am, obviously. Well, uh, I'd forgotten the head boy thing, so I, I, I'm grateful to be reminded of my achievements. Um, so, yeah, well, the folk interest um, actually goes back to Purcell School. We were doing Kodai method um, of oral training. We used lots of modal music. And coming from a very strictly classical diatonic background, the sound of modern music was quite exotic and we used lots of folk songs in that training as well. That's where I first heard English folk song and I just fell in love with it. And around the same time we were also um, performing music by Vaughan Williams who incorporates you know, lots of traditional songs into his music. And I was captivated by that. Um, and so I just started getting more interested in the English 20th century uh, art song, art music, revival or folk music, Williams, Holst, Delius. And one of my classmates, who I'm still friends with now, said to me, oh, if you like folk, folk music, you'll like this band. And she gave me a tape of Jeff Tull, which is actually, is prog rock, but some of it was quite folk influenced in the late 70s. Yeah, yeah. And I loved it. And from there, I started to listen to um, Steel Life Span, Fairport Convention, all the folk rock groups. And then started going back to source material and going to the folk club at Cecil Sharp House in Camden in London. I used to cycle there and the barman would serve me underage, that was another incentive. And so I, so I, and that's when I started really getting into the, the roots of the tradition. And then when I was 18 or 19, I went to the first ever National Cider Festival in Camden. And the, the resident band for the event was a band called the Yetis, who some of you might know. If you listen to the Archers, well, if you listen to it in the old days before lockdown, on the Sunday morning omnibus, that's the Yetis playing the Archers theme tune with uh, accordions and so on. And I got talking to them, and it turns out that the singer, his surname is Sartin, and he said, there is a body of songs, traditional folk songs, that have been collected from the Sartin family in 1905 to 1907. And that was it. Yeah, I was off on the folk. Train. So, so you you ha you have a your your family have a sort of folk folk history, as it were. Yeah, although it's yeah, it's not it's not a continuous one, but 
Uh, yes, and uh, um, subsequently when I went up to Oxford, I started to go to all the folk sessions, the folk club there and the pub sessions, and there was a large Irish contingent in Oxford. So that plus students plus the um, sort of Morris tradition, the Cotswold Morris tradition, meant there was loads of music going on in the pubs, and you could go to an informal session every night. And so, you know, when I was theoretically studying music at Oxford, I was actually doing my apprenticeship in the, in the pubs of East Oxford at night time. So how do you, how did you, how did this sort of affect your playing and your singing? Because obviously if you've been knocking out uh, a Magnificat and an Optimistus every evening and, and then you'd be going off and singing folk and playing, how did that affect how you played and how you sang? Um, well, that's a very good question actually because it's taken me years and years to find my own voice because I was approaching traditional song as a formal singer and it's very that sort of delivery and with the sort of classical enunciation and it's taken me well it was about three or four years ago actually when i started singing a traditional song yeah so my friend came into the room and said oh you sound like a proper folk singer now because i'd started to sing in my own voice and a lot of the old traditional singers used to talk about saying a song and not singing a song and i think that's really pertinent because actually it's delivering it in your own voice that comes first but I can still do the classical thing and I was singing which is the cathedral about five years ago um, right. but I had to switch right. I had to switch brains yes so to, it's a brain thing but you, I mean so I, I, I mean what would you say then as a folk singer that you you're you're focusing them pretty much entirely on the text yeah you're focusing on delivering the story and it's not about virtuosity it's about clarity and you're a vessel for a traditional song it's not about you you have to sort of or well, at least pretend to forget about ego <laughs> yeah that's that's a, it's important and so what about the oboe so I, I mean for me i mean i i wouldn't say oboe was a particularly traditional folk instrument is am i wrong about that no you're, you're correct i mean oboes were too expensive for you know the working folk to ever have you know they're quite elaborate instruments and when i started on the folk scene there were two other people who played over neither of whom are playing now um so there was no precedent and i just had to find my own path and find the sort of tunes that suit the obo and i mean a lot of french stuff suits the obo because they've got their tradition of the bombard and uh, bagpipes particularly in northern france and song accompaniment. I mean, you, traditionally, people use things like violins and flutes and folk music. No reason to not use an oboe. Right, right. So, um, when you're coming to uh, a new song, you know, you you tend to do a lot of you you do your own arrangements of them. Yes. Well, the, the minute that you sing a traditional song, you have it. You it is your own arrangement. There's no copyright and there's no set way of performing because there are no markings, you know, no tempo markings or anything. You just, the minute you perform it, it's your own song. And yeah, we, we do our arrangements. We tend to do them together, but sometimes we do them down the phone, particularly at the moment. Uh, and we bring our own influences, you know, whether it's classical, early music, rock, pop music, whatever. We bring those influences to the tradition. And that's very important because the tradition has to be something that keeps moving forward and evolving, otherwise it's just a fossilised museum music. Yeah, yeah. So um, we ought to move on to talk a little bit about Bellowhead because uh, they did sort of, they were a massive sort of huge new influence on the folk scene when they started. Um, so just, just tell us a bit about, about that. that. I, I don't know whether it's apocryphal, the, the background that the, the two guys were stuck in traffic jam and thought, oh, who are the people we'd most like to play with? And all that. I mean, is that actually true? It is actually true. I was due to go on stage at Hitching Folk Club and I was just having a meal before the gig and I got a call from the two Johns who were a performing duo already saying, um, we're on the M25, do you want to be in the band? And that's how it started. Oh, yeah. So, um, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon, I think. Um, for me, particularly interesting, you've got a lot of really great musicians. A lot of great musicians all at the top of their game. 
suddenly gathered in one room. So how did, how did that actually work? I mean, how, when you were rehearsing, what sort of rehearsal leadership was there? What, you know, what, how did that actually work? Because you can't have everybody going, no, we've got to do it like that, we've got to do it like that, or no, if I was doing it, I'd do it like that. So how did that, that must have taken time to find that sort of voice. Um, to be perfectly honest, the only, only uh, modus operandi was for individuals in the band to arrange pieces and score them out in surveillance or whatever and give it to the rest of the band. And then at that point, we'd rehearse together and we'd make further changes. You know, the, the brass players would make things more brass-like um, if, if one of the non-brass players was arranging, you know. We'd elaborate or improvise our lines and find a way of making it more us and getting off the page as quickly as possible. But there was only one piece we ever sort of arranged without dots. And we never recorded it either. Um, but it was a very, very difficult process. Right. So when you're then with that sort of group, um, were the performances opportunities to improvise further? Or were the, or is it, it's like it's too tight? You've got to... You, or, or, or did that start to happen after you've been performing for a couple of years or whatever? Um, after a few years, yes, we started writing arrangements that left space for improvisation, particularly from the jazzers and also from the fiddles. Um, so yeah, there was a flexibility in it, but there were certain pieces and certain moments of the pieces where we had to be tight. So, um, but in terms of like, if it was there like a leader, was there one person who, if, in, if there was going to be something that needed sorting, or did that never ever arise? Because I can understand the string quartet, you know, you get a string quartet, so there's normally there's one who's like a little bit more bullshit than the other three. But when you've got like 15, um, that's a lot of people. Well, if you ask um, all 11 members of the band who was the leader, you'd get 11 different answers, I think. Um, no one had final say in anything. I, I, I suppose... It, Except maybe the arrangers of that particular piece, right? Um, because most people in the band contributed arrangements. Thank yeah. you. So, so did you realise early on that this was something big? Yeah, at our very first gig, um, the band was assembled really for Oxford Folk Festival, the first Oxford Folk Festival, and it was an experiment, and we didn't think it would last very long. And at that very first gig in the Oxford Town Hall. The audience all got up and started dancing around uh, in, in a way I'd never seen at a folk gig before. And we were blown away by, by it and just thought, this really has legs. And then that summer we played at Sidmouth Folk Festival, which is where I am now, Sidmouth. And the crowd were dancing so much, they broke the uh, dance floor. And then we brought out an EP, and it was just meant to be a, a demo EP. And we recorded it on the County Road in Oxford. It wasn't particularly polished. Um, got sent out as a promo to venues and so on. And the next thing I got um, awarded at one of the folk awards, the BBC folk awards. It was a momentous time actually, we just didn't see, we had no idea where it was going to go. And then the next thing we we're doing in Glastonbury, we we're working at um, Abbey Road, you know, it was, it's, it's quite overwhelming. And I, I got asked recently to write some notes for, we were, um, re-releasing our album from 10 years ago, Hedonism, and I got asked to write some memoirs about those days, and I can't even remember a lot of it. It was such a blur, but very exciting. A blur in, in terms of just, it was just, you were doing so much, and it was all just, the band was just like a, 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 a phenomenon that just sort of took off, and you were just part of it. Yeah, I mean, we, we spent days at the BBC doing interviews. We got um, interviewed, I got misquoted in The Guardian, that's one of my claims to fame. Um, we played for Chris Evans, we played at Common Garden, we did, uh, played at the proms, you know, and it was just, we got swept so, off our feet. What do, you, what do you think it was? I think the world was ready, or well, certainly Britain was ready for something that ha had a traditional element, it was grassroots fun music. Um, right. And it also coincided with the sort of growth of festivals. Um, I think people were getting really sick and tired of uh, synthetic pop music or something a bit more real. Yeah, and um, 
do you think there was any, there were any compromises? I mean, as, as a folk musician, do you think that other folk musicians got it, believed in it, or was it, oh, this is just like, you know, this is too popular, as it were? I know that's a slightly crazy thing, but it, it can sometimes be that, particularly, you know, Oh, you know the the way they're doing this stuff. This is this is this is crossover now. Um, yeah, we certainly had our detractors, um, and people thought it was too raucous or whatever. The older generation, but actually now, um, well, no, I think actually during time they accepted us because they saw the knock-on effect that um, traditional English music was being played on national radio and national TV and inspiring youngsters who then have gone out to look for themselves for traditional music and they've kept the whole they've kept folk music alive so and i think that had contributed to that there were always going to be naysayers particularly what has been often a slightly conservative genre but if you're not if you're not creating waves you're not pushing the envelope to mix metaphors yeah 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 no i, I can totally see that so so do you miss it terribly i really do and we've yeah. just put together a a homemade video of the 11 of us playing what was our biggest hit single, New York Girls, to coincide with the release of um, yeah, the re-release of that particular album. And we all did it from our bedrooms or whatever and stitched it together. It's actually really good fun. Um, and I must admit, after doing it and seeing the finished thing, I, I had a little moment. And it was really nice to be back with everyone because we were a family. We were together for 12 years. Mm. We toured together, we slept on the bus together. We've all seen each other have children and watched our families growing up together and we're still all in touch, we're still all friends and we still work together. And yeah, I do miss it. So did it have to did it have to finish? I mean it's a, it's it was on a roll, wasn't it? Um, I think it was time for it to finish. I think it was best to, to stop these things when you're at the at the peak rather than let them roll on and eventually become a sort of tribute act to yourself. Um, but, and then the lead singer decided he wanted to leave anyway. I've got to admit, I was getting really tired of touring. Um, and some of us were. And on the very last tour, we went out with two sleeper buses, um, caterers, a pantechnican, a trainer. The whole team comprised nearly 30 people. And there were two viruses going around, one on each bus. So I ended up having to go on antibiotics. And just the, the stress of it all, and the, sleeping in a bus with 11 other people it's just it's not right and um, so when it finished i actually was relieved but you know five years down the road or whatever it is now it's four years i do really miss it and if anyone wants to have a look at bellahead on online if you go to our youtube page you'll see the video of new york girls that we put together about two weeks ago and it's really good fun yeah yeah, yeah cool that's really cool so how do you think it changed you as a musician and a performer because it must yeah you know, as you say this is 12 years that's an enormous enormous chunk of your performing life i don't know if it did change me i, I think maybe i learned more about the theatrical aspects of performing because normally we just stand on stage and we play and we talk to the audience but this was sort of using movement and staging and so on and i think that might have informed the things i've done since um and working with people from diff with the diff different influences, you know, the jazzers, with the brass section with jazzers, everyone brought their own genre and influences. I suppose I've learned from them as well, particularly the trumpet player who's really good at scoring jazz. I learned a few things from him. So yeah, it's helped me grow as a musician, definitely. Um, I think yeah. in other ways it's affected me. My, my partner said to me at the time, she said, every time you go on tour with Bellahead, you age six months. So I think it's, it's had a... A lasting effect on me as well. <laughs> <laughs> just, just purely the exhaustion of doing all the gigs. Yeah, yeah. And literally yeah. after the very last fellow head gig, which we did at Oxford Town Hall, coming around first circle, I went home and I fell over and had to be put to bed. <laughs> so, what do you think within uh, what what makes a good performer in terms of folk music? Then, do you think? And do you think it's particularly different in the folk scene than the classical scene? I think there is definitely a big difference. I think in the folk scene, it's going back to what we were saying earlier, it's, a, it's not about self, it's not about virtuosity. It's about being a tradition bearer. 
and that has to always be borne in mind when he's singing and performing things. Let the song speak for itself and don't and try to not use artifice. Of course we do use artifice, but it's a different sort. And think technique, for instance, you just have to put it on a bit of a back pedal. Uh, so, so it's a very different aesthetic. So uh, do you, I mean, but that, that's suggesting that the technique is not so important, but the technique is important. The technique is there to, yeah, to, to support one singing in a way that's as natural as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. I mean, yeah. What, what about with the, the playing, though? Because like, quite a lot of the stuff that you do, you're sort of singing and playing at pretty much the same time, often. Yeah, I mean, uh, technically, traditional melodies can be quite difficult, particularly the, the, more, the ones from the Celtic traditions and from Northumbria. You have to have a, a very good technique to play them. English fiddle is a bit of an open season because there is no one particular style. There's no school of English fiddle, whereas if you play Irish fiddle, you might go to the Saturday morning schools and learn it. Or same in Scotland. In England, there is no school, and you just, the way you play is, the, I suppose you, you're informed by the people around you and what you listen to. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have to have bad technique, and I think there's a balance to be had. Yeah. Good How many is support this? playing in a song? Would you say that most of the, certainly the members better, most of the musicians that you work with have come from a classical background initially? Not very many, actually. Surprisingly few. I think maybe for the older generation that might have been true, but for the, for the younger ones, there are now sort of, there are work, loads of workshops for young people, there are residential courses, there are university degrees now in traditional music, so a lot of them are, have actually just come through the folk world. Right, and so, so now, you know, Bella Hood's behind you, um, you've got, Belshazzar's Feast is your principal band now? Uh, one of them. I mean, it, uh, although we're going to stop touring in a couple of years because my colleague is quite a lot older than me and he's tired of it. But yes, I suppose Belshazzar's sort of comedy duo is the principal one. And then I've also got a trio called Faustus. Yeah. And we tour and record quite a lot as well. Right. And so, what, what, that, what, how do you see, what would you like to be doing over the next sort of couple of decades I mean where do you where would you are there things you feel you'd really like to explore with your sort of musical world that you haven't done yes actually um, I've just started working solo which I've been wanting to do for years but never really had the confidence all the time to do it and I got offered an online zoom solo concert and my first one ever and it's my first Zoom concert and my first solo concert. And I've done one subsequently and I've really loved it. And then a friend of mine who runs a, a music venue pub in London said, will you come down and do a concert in our garden now the lockdown has eased? And she said, would you do it solo? And I thought, yeah, I'll do a solo gig, live. So that's a real challenge. But I, the more I thought about it, I realized I wasn't sure I could get a full sort of 2.45 minute set together of me um, singing and playing solo and I said this to my friend and she said why don't we get a support act why don't you get one of your kids and actually now it's turned into Sartin and Sons and I've got two of my boys coming down and playing and singing on their own and then with me as well and awesome. I, we've got the idea of actually getting a family band together the sort of folk von Trapp family so that and that's what I want to be doing yeah yeah the, the, and so when you're doing a solo gig you're what what does that comprise I and mean, you're doing like Accompanying yourself, piano, fiddle. Yeah, you can't often play the um, overs at the same time. Yeah. No, no I, I did. I've only done sort of solo over pieces. It doesn't work so well. But for a long time, I've been accompanying myself on the violin when I sing. But I've never used the piano. The piano's not used by many folk musicians, and they can be a bit snobby about it. But actually, right. increasingly, we're using the piano. And I thought, well, I've got no choice. I'm at home. I, I'm trying to learn the concertina really unsuccessfully. So I thought. I'll try the piano out, and it's worked. And I've had really good feedback. So when I do my live solo gig, I'll take my uh, it's the Casio keyboard, no Yamaha, Clavi, whatever it's called, yeah, yeah. and use that and plug, clap it over, um, 
and then I'll also accompany myself on the violin, and I'll do some solo singing as well. Uh, right, and accompanied. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, what about composition? Because you've, you know, you've done quite a bit of composition. You've composed a, or, you arranged a, a carol for me a few years ago. Um, um, because that's that's been quite a big part of your world as well. It is, and going back to what you said about arranging traditional songs, that is composition as well. And we write tunes and so on. But I've started doing a bit more sort of serious composition as well, um, lot, you know, akin to the piece that I wrote for you, David. I've been doing more of that sort of thing too, which I really like. I mean, I, I love doing it. It's, it just happens when it happens. If people ask, you know. Yeah. Is there a folk opera? Uh, sort of, yeah. And we did actually, we staged it two years ago. And it's called The Transports. And it's set, it's, uh, it's the story about the first transport of convicts to Australia. And in the 70s, a chap called Peter Bellamy uh, wrote a load of songs about it. And they were stitched together with a sung narration. So, yeah, basically a uh, folk opera. And we've com completely rejigged it and put it on. Uh, two years ago and the year before and toured it around the country and so on. And, and in terms of the, the sort of um, folk music itself, I mean, you're, you focus mostly on the English tradition, is that? And, and, and when, you, when you're like traveling to other countries to perform, um, do you like look out for some of their stuff and their, their performers to listen to and sort of um, see how that might influence the stuff you do? Um, yeah, I went to Turkey and I've been working with Turkish musicians, which is quite interesting to try and make two very different musical languages work together. And yeah, wherever I go, I always try and sort out the music. And I went to uh, France and ended up joining in with a, a, a fest noz in Brittany. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's particularly influenced me, but I find, find it very interesting. And I love trying to work with people who have different uh, traditions. Yeah. Background. I and how does the, 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 I mean, the traditions within, I mean, the, the folk songs, what sort of era are we talking about most of them come from? It's difficult to put a finger on it. A lot of the older ballads were first noted and written down in the early 18th century. But we, obviously, we think a lot of them date back to before then, but there, there are many records. But certainly, yeah, by the late 1600s, early 1700s, there were some older ballads. But there are different scenes. I mean, the folk music is not, it's not a definition, it's a description, really. Because right? there are so many different currents that have been formed. Folk music musical, um, ballad sheets, which were printed up, broadside ballads, as we call them. They were sort of uh, songs written on themes of the day, a bit like tabloids, you know, a murder or a battle or whatever. And these things were written in and printed up in major conurbations and then were sung by hawkers around the country, and they entered the oral tradition. And that, those broadside ballads date from the 1600s to the early 1900s. So there's that, there's sort of that literary influence as well. Uh, then you get what so-called national songs that were composed by bona fide composers that have entered the, the oral tradition. Yeah, music hall, as I say, even, even now in traditional music, it's evolving and people are, you know, the kids are writing traditional music to house dance beats. In the 1950s, there were Morrisides who would play rock around the clock for Morris dancing. People are writing stuff now. Where, where is it coming from? Uh, well, I mean, the thing is that all the archives have been cleaned to death. So a lot of the traditional songs everyone knows. But there's always new stuff to be found, and that inspires you to re make new arrangements of old songs. There are people writing songs in a traditional style or in traditional themes. Um, all sorts but, of people, actually. But would you, would you say that there's... And what would you say is the music that is being written now by whoever that is going to, if you like, be the sort of stuff that someone might find and, and arrange in a hundred years' time? Well, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was teaching some teenagers at the weekend on Zoom, um, Southwest Music School, so they're all in the West Country. And I tasked them all with finding a traditional song or tune from their locality and then arranging it. And one of the um, women came up with a, a song and she said, we all sing it in the pubs around here in Cornwall and it's a song about Cornish emigration. She said, I don't know anything about it. I don't know where it comes from, but I just know the song. And she sang it. And I said, well, actually, I know the guy who wrote it. Who wrote it. Um, 
And, that, and he's from a, a popular duo called Show of Hands, a chap called Steve Knightley, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago. And already, two years ago, and I went to the pub, and there was a traditional only tune session going on, and I sat in the corner with the pipe just listening and keeping a low profile. And they started playing one of the tunes that I'd written, but didn't know it was by me, and thought it was anonymous. And at that point, I, I posted up on Facebook, I am now anon. I am now trad anon. Now my work here is done. <laughs> well, indeed, and there is nothing else for you to do. You have made no, it. That's it. <laughs> Um, in terms of like, though, in terms of like some of the other forms of music, do you, do you see folk uh, now um, coming into uh, like other other popular forms of music from uh, I don't know hip hop or whatever? I'd like and you're saying to that. Yeah. Over that. There is not much. Is, there, there is, in some ways, some of these things are coming from a similar sort of background. It just is a contemporary background rather than yeah. a like country background. I mean, there are attempts to fuse tradition and modern music, and there's a, uh, an outfit called the Demon Barbers who put on traditional song and dance with rappers and break dancers, or whatever they call now, I'm showing my age, and they fuse that. And so there are things happening. Um, and in, in the more commercial world, I mean, Mumford and Sons had enormous success, and they weren't playing phone music, people thought they were, because they were using a more traditional instrumentation, like the banjo. And so that has that helped to feed at least the folk vibe into more general consciousness. Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, I'm sure some of our folk uh, will have some questions for you. So um, I might just open the floor and uh, and uh, and see what other people because I know that some people have been huge fans as well. <laughs> First question: Bellowhead reunion. We sort of, we're, we're sort of feeling that until you all have massive tax bills to pay in ten years, that's not going to happen. Um. Oh. Um. It's it's been mooted. The idea of a reunion has been mooted. And we return to the idea every year or so, where, uh, yeah, around when our tax returns are due. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying never again. And I think having done that reunion video, it's inspired us all a bit more to perhaps do something. I can't say any more than that. No, well, that's I'd fair like enough. To, I'd like to, my bank manager would like us to get back together again. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. How often? Does Paul get to Hallsway Manor in Somerset? Um, I have to correct you there, David. It's pronounced Halsey. I do apologise. Um, <laughs> no, I go down there. I was going down there a lot several times a year to run workshops and so on. And in fact, in 2016, Faustus, my trio, were in residence there. So, and I was due to do a workshop weekend in June with a Turkish singer that I was talking about, uh, and that. Has been cancelled or postponed. Uh, there, are, there is some, there are some weekends planned for next year when once the place reopens. So, Moira, come on down. Fingers crossed. Uh, what, do you, um, what do your sons play? Ah, oh. oh, yeah. Um, my youngest Joe sings and plays guitar um, and fiddle very badly by his own admission. He's very good at jazz as well as folk and classical, and he may well go down the cool scholarship path that David and I did. My middle son plays mandolin in a very, very good KV band. My eldest son does uh, DJing and producing. And did, did you, I mean, how much did you push them in terms of going into music? Never, never. I told them to get a proper job. And that was that probably, is probably what pushed them into going to music. They were <laughs> rebelling against me. I mean, I mean, the oldest two don't do it for a living. And they're working. Um, Joe, my youngest, may well end up becoming a musician of some sort. But I, I never push them. I just encourage them. And, and they're surrounded by music. Their, their mum sings. Their grandparents all do music. We took them to festivals. They've become to Sidmouth every year of their lives. So right. they didn't really stand a chance of not doing music somehow. But I never force them to play an instrument. Or I encourage, well, I just encourage them. Yes. Nice. And um, so, which which is the, your favourite uh, Bellowhead studio album? Uh, I think Hedonism, the one that's ten years old this year, because it just it has so many, well, as I say, slightly vague memories. Though, but it was such a happy period, 
It was a groundbreaking album. We made it into the charts. It was the, it's the highest selling folk record on an in, on an independent label of all time. And it was just such a happy time for everyone. And the mu music itself, we all recorded it in, in the same room. It sounds really fresh. A bit rough around the edges, edges but you know, the real thing. So that's yeah. why I came from. And so that that sort of you felt that was like that was that was the, that really represented the band. That was like you guys, at really like how you'd like to be remembered. Yeah, I think that album defined the band definitely. Right, that is our our classic. And and so so what apart from your solo Zoom gig, or which actually has probably took up quite a lot of your time in lockdown, has there been any other you know fabulous escapades that have kept your days? Uh, um, free of tedium. Um, I've never been so busy. I've been doing so much stuff. I've been working online with some dancers. That's been quite interesting. Um, contemporary dancers. I've been doing collaborations with various people, um, playing over, singing piano. I did a series of um, songs and tunes for VE Day um, for, for elderly people, like Lily Marlene and Michael Sedover. And oh, we did a survey of people in an old people's home, and their top 20 songs, which things like Singing in the Rain, Over the Rainbow, um, Ki Sera Sera. And so at the moment I'm working on uh, those songs, which I'm going to put onto a USB stick and onto YouTube so that elderly people can watch them in isolation in their care homes. So I've really enjoyed it. Some of those old songs are brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So I've been yeah. doing, I've just been doing so many projects. I've got a, um, I'm doing an online choir for Sydney Festival tomorrow night. I'm doing some more gigs online with my bands. Um, I've got to record some fiddle for a Kaylee, an online Kaylee. So, yeah, I've, been, I've never been busier. And also, I've just done loads of gardening as well. My vegetable well, patch is going to have a tree. And what about the, 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 the folk scene more generally? How's that sort of going to get its act? It's adapted. Together? It's adapted really, really quickly. Um, particularly more, uh, than there's the, more than the classical scene. Well, I, I don't know because I'm not so in touch with the classical scene actually. But um, very quick, very early on, Oxford Folk Weekend got cancelled, and the organisers decided that they were going to try and do something on Zoom. And so I was in the first sort of cohort of people doing online concerts, and they using they they really sussed out how to do it. They've now progressed to the point where I did a concert with Belshazzar's Feast for Oxford Folk Weekend last week. And we actually had a mixer with us, which plugged in, and then an engineer up in Yorkshire or somewhere was mixing us on Zoom. So they've they've sussed the tech, and yeah. that's happening all over the folk world. Um, to be honest, for years we've been saying the folk world needs to be a bit more tech and internet savvy, like the pop world, and it's happened. And, and so here at Sidmouth, for instance, last night, pre-recorded material and also streamed. And it's on YouTube to watch for another week. So it's using that technology, and and a lot of folkies are quite techy anyway. So I think the folk scene's coped very well. It's just the uncertainty of knowing where live music is going to go in the future. I mean, this festival here, they're talking about actually running it properly next year, but it may well be that we can't have any dancing due to right. non-contact. So that, those sort of things are really uncertain at the moment. And what was your favourite song to perform in Bellowhead? Um, I can't really answer that. I mean, I, I, I'm very proud of London Town, which is one that I wrote, which is on the first album. Um, but there's, there's a beautiful song on Hedonism called Captain Wedderburn, which I like. And we also recorded Amsterdam on Hedonism, and I really like that as well. We had one final question, which was, how different is your folk voice and your choral voice? Well, now, that you feel, now that you feel that you've kind of found a voice that, that, that is, mm. is genuinely something you feel really comfortable with. I do sometimes find that my classical voice creeps into my folk voice. Hopefully it doesn't happen the other way around. Because, <laughs> you know, when you're, as you say, bashing out a mag and monk, it's not very appropriate to sort of do that. Um, but they are, I think they are quite different, I and mean, hopefully they're still me, but I don't really do so much classical singing now anyway. I've done a little bit, but uh, gone are the days of doing yeah, services and so on regularly. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Paul, it's been awesome to talk to you. Um, Great to Enjoy you. the rest of your time by the sea. Um, I will do. We'll have to entice you to one of our concerts in the future. I'll do. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, nice to meet everybody. And um, bye, everyone. See you.